Hello everyone, I'd like to welcome you to the second Cricket Wales Q&A with none other than Roman Walker. Um, unfortunately for you guys, uh, in the place of last week's interviewer, Andrew Salter, you are stuck with me this week, so I'll hopefully like to provide a bit of banter. Um, not sure it'll be very much, but uh, I'll do my best. Um, hopefully Roman can do a lot of the talking, so be easy. So, yeah, like to welcome Roman. How are you? How have you been doing, Roman? Yeah, good, mate. Yeah, not too bad. Uh, looking forward to hearing what people want to know. So, uh, yeah, it's exciting. Yeah, I'd love, I, think I'd, I think it's got to be mentioned that the facial hair, um, what's going on there? <laughs> it's, it's poor, more. isn't it? I, uh, no, it was just one of them things, just sitting, sitting in the mirror. Just thought I might as well just leave it like that and see how it looks. And uh, I forgot to take it off. So, um, yeah, that's what we're stuck with at the moment. <laughs> I'm not sure what's worse, the all the hair off the top or the facial hair. I'm not, not Definitely like... the facial hair, mate. Definitely the facial hair. Yeah. I think the, the skinhead suits me more than what a goatee does. Yeah, I think I potentially should take all mine off, but I'll leave the moss on for the moment. I'd love to see the hairline and where that hairline is. Oh, it's, my hairline's fine. There's, there's a few <laughs> in the squad who are probably lacking a bit of hairline, so... <laughs> I am already, and I'm only 19. Okay. Um, okay, should we start with the first question? So, first one is from Anya in West Wales, who wants to know if you think it's possible to be a late developer and still break into the professional game, whether that's male or female. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think there's, there's been a fair few people in professional male cricket, uh, as I know, that have been late bloomers. Um, one being Ben Sanderson, um, being the first name that comes to mind. Uh, I think he was mid-twenties, if not late-twenties, when he was still playing minor counties cricket and then got picked up by a professional squad. Um, and he's done amazingly well. He's probably one of the best bowlers who hasn't played international cricket on the county circuit. Yeah, um, I so did play him in a minor counties game, I think it would have been 2015, I think. Um, yeah. He was tearing up the North Ants against us a couple of years later. Yeah, <laughs> five years later, he's, he's one of the best or counted as one of the best uh, red ball bowlers going, and probably white ball as well. He's got got a lot of uh, a lot of stuff going for him. And uh, like I say, yeah, he, he was a late bloomer. Um, so to answer the question, definitely, if like don't give up because it doesn't matter what stage. If if you believe you can get into the uh, into the county circuit or into any sort of professional game in general, never mind cricket. Um, and if you believe you're good enough, it's never too late. If if you if you're there and you and you do hard and you work hard enough, sorry, then you've got everything going for you. So it doesn't matter how old you are, you can still get there. Yeah, probably to a certain extent. I'm not sure. I'm not sure the kind of middle aged fifty year olds are probably. <laughs> not sure, not sure, uh, I'm sure my dad would love to be a county cricket player, <laughs> and I'm, I'm not sure he'd be there anymore. I think it'd be a lot of hard work, but. Oh, yeah. I think you agree with that. I think there's a lot of cases where people have uh, got into the game a bit later, so it's uh, certainly never to give up. Never really one to give up on. Well, I think yeah. I think uh, Hogs was a bit of a late bloomer, wasn't he? Michael Hogan. Yeah, well, I, I'm not, I think he started in, with uh, what he obviously played club cricket in New South Wales, and then moved across to Perth. I think quite late and yeah, came across. I think I'm, I'm, I've got a number of 26 or 27 in my head when he started playing professional cricket. Yeah, well, he's, he's a great like guy. He's obviously he's been fantastic for us over the last kind of eight, eight, yeah. eight season with us now. And he's been... So, yeah, that's, a, that's another great example there. Yeah. Okay, so the second question is from David, from your neck of the woods up in North Wales, um, who wants to know how many bowling variations do you think he needs as a pace bowler in A, T20, and B, the longer form again? Uh, so, th these days, obviously, bowling variations have come into the game over the last sort of five years massively. Um, and further than that, maybe in 10 years. Um, and they're taking more of an impact as we play uh, every game. Um, so, you've got three or four different ways of bowling a slower ball now with different names, obviously, leg cutter, off cutter, back of the hand, slow ball, knuckle ball, whatever you want to call them. Um, so I, I think, I'm not sure 
you need too many. I think if you keep to maybe three balls, you've got your stop ball and then a variation ball is in variation of pace or the ball coming out of your hand. I think maybe two if you've got an off cutter or a leg cutter or a back of the hand slower ball or a knuckle ball if you can bowl it. That's that that always keeps a batsman on their toes. Um and then other variations, what I count as variations, um, are Yorker and Bouncer, which you, if you use them clever enough, they'll they'll probably serve you better than what a slow ball or anything else will. Um but you've I think a lot of it with bowling is you've got to know when to bowl at the right time. So for me, bowling a slower ball, I don't know about you, Rose, um, but for me, bowling a slower ball, if I'm in a T20 into my second over, um, I can almost feel when the batsmen are getting a bit more comfortable with me. Um, and that sort of dictates when I bowl my variations, if it be a slow ball or a bouncer. So even, even in my first over, if I bowled three or four balls and the batsmen have come forward, hit it well, hit me for runs or even if they've hit it to the field I know they're sort of comfortable with me um, so I know that's that's when I sort of bowl my variations so I know I've got so the ones that I've got that I try and keep short and use more times if you get what I mean I, I sort of keep the um, amount of variations that I use quite small um, so I've got the back of the hand slow ball um, an off cutter which comes out at different paces um, and that'll, that's almost like natural variation unless I really try. And when I do try, it probably comes out a bit too slow. Yeah. Um, so I think just a normal off cutter, if you try and bowl that and finish your action off, that's absolutely fine. And a bouncer. Um, so I, I think that they're, they're my three that I use, and I'll just use them a bit more frequently and, and uh, mix them in and out with each other, depending on uh, conditions as well. Yeah, um, yeah I certainly agree. I think it's getting that, making sure you you nail them and have your stand at the top of the mark and you know you can nail those those variations for the balls. So if you look yeah. at Pat Brown, he's got basically that one variation. He, I think I, I was watching a game where they put up the, how many times, what types of balls he bowled at the death. And I think about 80% were knuckle balls. Um, yeah. So I think if you, you've got a ball that you nail and you nail it well, I think it's something. That's yeah, it's, it's def definitely, it'll definitely be more effective if you keep your bag small and perfect them two or three balls rather than having six or seven different balls and not quite being there or being quite average with all six or seven of them. Yeah. I think that's where I went wrong a couple of years ago. I tried bowling everything, just trying everything out, but I started thinking, oh, I can bowl this, I can bowl that, I can bowl the back of the hand, I can, I'm, I can bowl a Yorker when I want, but you realise when you do it in a game that it's not up to standard. So I, then I focused on my variations and trying to get them right and I still haven't got them right now I probably won't get them perfect for another two or three years and that's just the way cricket is um, but hopefully when I do get them perfect they'll serve me well that I've got a smaller bag with better uh, quality almost yeah yeah sounds good um, okay so for number three so Cal wants to know how you divide your time at skills training um, so how much of that schedule is directed by coaching staff? Um, so, for example, do you spend more time in your bowling than your batting? And what kind of divide you would be in terms of skill or just netting? Yeah, so when, when we go into nets, we have a, um, we have a schedule that we go into. Um, so it could be half an hour slots. I'll have to jog back my memory now because it's been so long since we played cricket, I can't remember. Um, but we'll have our time slots, and whether it be half an hour or 45 minute time slots um, for bowling, uh, that's what we'll do there. And I think the batsmen are probably, they want to get a quality session in that's a bit smaller. So they'll probably bat for half an hour, and we'll end up bowling at two groups of batsmen potentially. Um, but then flip it to um, people like uh, me, you, uh, Marchant, we will probably bat. We may get the chance to bat the same amount, but we'll probably bat 20 minutes uh, on the norm, um, just because we've taken so much time bowling. Um, but I, th I think it's natural with, with cricket and the way cricket goes is that 
the bowlers get less time batting in the nets than the batsmen do. And obviously the bowlers get more time bowling in the nets than the batsmen do. Well, I'll try and hunt out as much time batting as possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's so almost I think, a, I think, uh, yeah. a few coaches. I think, I think Steve, I'm contributing to Steve Watkins. Uh, <laughs> shoulder going to put there. Yeah. Steve, in, but, uh, Steve, I want to bat more in nets. <laughs> Yeah, maybe you shout out to them on this if they're watching. You want some more time? <laughs> no, obviously it'd be, it'd be nice to bat more in nets, but then you're taking away time from other batsmen that could be really valuable time. So uh, I think skills based as well is um, is almost with nets is earning my time in nets. So if I want to bat more in nets, I've got to earn that. So I've got to do that in my own time and and really lock down my batting to be able to almost push myself into a bit more of a all round a role rather than a, a bowling all rounder at the moment. Um, so that that just goes with cricket is if you work hard, you will get where you want, and everybody's levels will be different. So if someone will want to play for England, if they work hard, they make it for England. Perfect, well done. But someone in club cricket might be playing third team, and if they work really hard and they make their first team debut, that's amazing as well, because it just shows that work hard, uh, working hard really does help. On your skills? Yeah, well, I think it's if without, I don't think anyone gets anywhere without hard work. So I think that's, if you want to get anywhere, especially in cricket, I think you're going to have to concentrate on those skills and it's got to be purposeful practice. Yeah. In terms of that sort of thing, there's no point going into nets and not having a clear mindset of where you want to get to. So. Yeah. And, and, and again, with the previous question as well, with the um, variations, um, that skill-based practice, it, it makes that practice a lot easier when, you've got, when you're focusing on less. So if I say I'm going to bowl 10 minutes of a back-of-the-hand slow ball, I'm going to bowl 10 minutes of hitting my stock ball, and then I'm going to bowl 10 minutes of hitting a Yorker, that makes it a lot easier than going, I'm going to do five minutes of the back-of-the-hand, five minutes off-cutter, five minutes Yorker, five-minute bouncer. Like it just, that makes the practice so much more purposeful that you know you're working on your, your absolute strengths. I think there's a few guys who've got to spend about 25 minutes bowling bouncers in our nets. I know. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure if you're in that category, Roman. But. Especially indoors. No, I'm not quick enough to bowl bouncers indoors yet and rush anyone. Oh, you bowl off 18 yards indoors. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? Don't we all? I bowl from the line. I bowl from the line. Yeah. Okay. Batting line. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> moving on. Um, Negan wants to know who you idolised as a youngster as a youngster, and do you actively try to copy them? Or do you think you actively try to copy them? Um, my idols, the first two people that come to mind, so I've got uh, a bowling idol and a batting idol. Um, the batting idol is Kevin Peterson. Um, grew up watching him. And I just think he, he was an absolute freak. He was amazing just to watch and, and see the way he went about the game. And almost the arrogance that he carried around with him, naturally, uh, as most people know. Um, but his, his talent was unbelievable. And that's all I wanted to do was be able to bat like Kevin Peterson. Now, I know uh, I haven't actively tried to copy him. Copy him. Um, into the switch hits and flamingos, though. Yeah. <laughs> I've done plenty of that before I bat like him. And then <laughs> that'll, be a, that'll be some sort of hard work if I do end up like that. Um, but I, I think he he was just a, a, a different level above everybody else. And I, I, I loved watching him. Um, I love what he's doing now after cricket um, with the Nature Reserve stuff. So as a person, I think he's actually a decent bloke considering what went on in the media. Um, and you can understand both sides of the media. But, hey um, but bowling idol for me was Freddie Flintoff. Um, just because that 2005 to 2009... Um, he was amazing, um, and again, he's, he's he's a character off the field, and uh, you you can really connect with him because he's just a normal lad, and uh, he he does some silly things which we all do, and that's that's how you can connect with him. But what a bowler he was as well, and uh, yeah, all, all I want to be when I grow up as a cricketer is bowl ninety mile an hour, be able to move the ball, make people jump about and have fun at the same time, which is exactly what he did. Um, so they're, they're my two idols. 
Oh, so not uh, about not choosing the your own Welsh uh, Simon Jones for that 05 Ashes. I know Salts gave me needle about that last time. Mate, Simon, honestly, watching watching him bowl because growing up, um, obviously because he was uh, unfortunately cut short for his career, um, you didn't hear too much about him when I was sort of growing up to sort of 10, 15 years old. And then when I started watching cricket videos on my own and just going off and watching the 2005 Ashes again, you sort of think, Jesus, this guy was unreal. This guy was amazing. Yeah, his but, smiles in that 05 Ashes were, I think, looking back, some of the guys speaking about him in that 05 Ashes, his ability with the old balls and all this reverse swing, it was... And, even yeah. though guys like Vaughan and Flintoff and stuff just kind of were have spoken really highly of his Simon's skills, and I was lucky enough to to play with him right at the start, or play with him right at the start of my career. Um, but yeah, so I think, but I I was Flintoff as well. Just I think it was the all rounder yeah. thing, watching him whack out. It's just the it's the, yeah. it's, it's, the it's the brashness that. His batting didn't look amazing, but he scored runs. And he, and he, it, it just the person he was, that you knew he was off the field, that you knew he was going to have a bit of fun. And he, he yeah. was an entertainer as well, so that, what, that's what made him really fun to watch. Yeah, I'm not sure I followed his uh, antics off the field, really. Um, <laughs> no, no, that's, uh, that's, the, that's the aim, is, is sort of keep the antics like Michael Atherton and uh, play cricket like, <laughs> like Flintoff. Well, I don't know why Michael Aston got that two in his three times. Yeah, well, you're not doing too many bad yeah, stories about He could be one of the maddest on the block, you never know. <laughs> okay, so um, next. Uh, Dan wants to know when you actually decided to push for a professional career in cricket and was there a particular moment when you suddenly felt sure and why was that? Um, so I played Wales age groups from... 10 to 17 um i think i missed i was sort of in and out of the sides between 13 and 14 and um that's at that point i thought well maybe cricket's not for me um and then i saw i sort of had a good season at 15 years old made my second team debut um at the end of the season in bath and sort of then i sort of thought well this is fun i'm having a good time happy days uh, and I had a good season with Wales in the 17s and got on the Academy with Glamorgan. I think it was at, at that point um, I thought I really want to be, I like, I really, really want to be a professional cricketer. Before that, it was, yeah, it'd be nice to be a professional cricketer. I love cricket and it'd be amazing to be able to do it as a job. But to the point where I really started pushing towards it, it was sort of 17 years old where I was playing academy cricket I was playing second team cricket I was I was playing a lot of uh, 17s as well when I could and I was I was doing well I, I never did amazing um I never blew the world away never took loads of fifers or loads of wickets scored loads of runs but I was really enjoying it and I'd chip away um so it, that that was really fun um and I think only recently like last season when um when I made my debut for Glamorgan um down at Sussex I thought Gee, I'm playing first team cricket. I'm playing first team county cricket, and it sort of hit me all at once. So I was like, well, I, I might be able to do this. So hopefully, I mean, we'll see in the future whether I, whether I'll keep it up and be able to do it. But um, there's there, there was that sort of click in my head where it was like, right, you, you, you can do this. Bit of confidence. You you can go and go ahead and, and smash it now. Yeah, um, which is yeah. I know those first few games that you kind of you have and you have a bit of success, and it kind of gives you that that uplift really to kind of think yeah I, I can kind of make yeah. it guys so yeah completely, completely I, I think the, the sweet thing was as well is that um, in one of the three T20s we played against Sussex at home and I got absolutely panned around the park by Laurie Evans um, I think I, I went north for 52 I think there was a few other boys who got a bit of sap in that game as well mind you <laughs> yeah yeah, it was it. It wasn't a sound flat. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I think um, that that game brought me back down to earth. So the first couple of games, I I hit a six to win on my debut. I'm flying high in the stars, and I came back towards the end of the season, took two on my debut, uh, two wickets on my debut against Somerset, 
Um, yeah, and then, so, yeah, so it's like, you, you, you're, flying, you're flying high, you're thinking, this, this is amazing, I, I can do it. And then it was really nice, like, in hindsight, at the time it wasn't very nice, but in hindsight, looking at it, being whacked around the park, brought me back down to earth and thought, right, you're not as good as you think you are, work harder and get better. And that really sort of kicked me into gear to work harder and, and, and almost overcome it. So now when I go and bowl against a, a world-class player, I want to be able to be beating him more than he's beating me. And obviously that's the game, but I want to be able to get on top of him more than he's getting on top of me. And that's, that's the aim. And, and it was really nice to be almost beaten down. You've got to go down to go up. That's my theory. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, it was never a never a straight path up. It was always going to be uh, a bit up and down. So, yeah. Um, okay, so Mal Malay, Malay from Swansea Cricket Club and Wales Under Thirteen asks, which is your best overseas experience? And I, I think we'll go with that one first. I think. Okay. Um, so I've, I've I think I've got two that are on par. So I spent. Four, four or five months in Australia um, two years ago now, uh, coming at, oh, a year and a half ago. Um, and I loved my time over there. I was in a place called Shepparton, which is two hours north of Melbourne in the sticks. Um, absolutely loved my time. They looked after me, loved the cricket, loved the lifestyle, loved the sun. Um, but on par with that was well, the. the no, no beaches. I think I can think of places I'd rather be in Australia. I think down I in, in Sydney or Melbourne in the city. Of I was in the outback. I was in the outback, and I loved my time too much in that village. I did. I I generally had no interest in going into Melbourne. I think the only time I went into Melbourne was for Country Week, and uh, I loved it down there when I was there. But I was like, I I love the quietness of being in the middle of that massive country, and having loads of friends on your doorstep that you can just visit when you want. And it was it had a really homely feel. Uh, that's what I loved about it. Um, but I'm trying, my, to, my, I'm trying to put you and quietness on the same. <laughs> not not really mixing. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a weird one coming from me. But um, no, that to everybody else the place was quiet. But when we were there, it got quite loud. So there would be there would be a few beers after a game on a Saturday in the sun. And you'd love that. You can you can chill out. But then when it came to Monday and you know you've got to go back to the gym and you've got to go and work hard, it's like really hard in the sun as well. So that was that was the dampener on my on my week is when I had to go to the gym and run in the sun and it was it was horrible. But the rest of it was so relaxing and it was it was amazing. It was really good cricket as well. I think um I came back and had a had a good season after after coming back from Australia there. Um, but also on, on par with that was um, when I went on tour with the England under-19s to New Zealand for the World Cup. Um, and you, that trip... You were in Queenstown for that for a bit, weren't you? Yeah, we, we were based in Queenstown for our last three weeks. So we were there for a month. Um, we turned up at Christchurch Airport, went to a place called Timaru, which was two hours south, for like three days. Um, pretty token and then we went to back up to Christchurch for a week and then we had three weeks in Queenstown it worked out really really well because Queenstown's amazing um, but it worked out really well that whenever we lost the game if so <laughs> we'd be going into a game if we lost this we stay in Queenstown if we win we go up to Auckland or something like that and then there'd be the next game that'd be like if we win this we go to Queen uh, we stay in Queenstown if we lose, we go somewhere else. And the games just kept going like that. And every time the, the result was the next game's in Queenstown, that's what result we got. And so it was perfect that that three weeks worked out in Queenstown. Absolutely amazing place. Yeah, Queenstown, I've, I've been lucky enough to visit it. And that is, I can say, it is yeah. one of the most spectacular places I've been to. Um, yeah, you have to save up a bit of money to go, though. Yeah, it's not, not, not cheap getting there, but it's, um, oh, if anyone, want somewhere to go and and put on their bucket list I'd put a Queenstown on it definitely um, and the other question from Malai was which ground do you like the most so what's your favourite ground on the circuit 
Oh my god. County ground. Um if you've got a club ga- club grounds, we can go we can go with that. Um essentially check out your county ground as well. Right. So right, can I chuck three at you? Oh, I'm not quite sure that was the question. It was a, it was a which ground do you like the most? I've, uh, I've extended it to club, ga- club grounds for you. So. Oh, no. Yeah, um, you've got to pick a winner. All right, county grounds got to be Sophia Gardens. I love it. It's just, it, it's a homely, proper, proper cricket ground. And it's, look, luckily enough, it's our home ground as well. Um, so that's my favourite county ground and club ground. Just shout out to Oswald Street Cricket Club because it's a beautiful ground. It's only small, but the wicket there is unbelievably flat, and I still love playing there. So that says something that a bowler on a flat wicket loves playing at, at that ground. What like what a ground that is! Amazing. Yeah, I've not had the chance to play Oswald Street, but I'll take your word for it. Okay, so um, what? From Fran, this question: What do you do in the off season? Um, do <laughs> Connection went a bit there, Troy. Do you have to find a job during that period? And uh, do you ever consider life after cricket? You got me. Do I ever consider life after cricket? And um, so, if we go back to the start of the question, so what do you do in the off season? Yeah. Um, do you have to find a job during that period? And do you ever consider life after cricket? Do, do you know what's coming with that job question here? I don't actually, no. So I didn't think there was anything coming. Right. So, <laughs> so firstly, um, in the off-season, we, uh, we have a month off after the, after the season. Um, and then we go into pretty intense training almost straight away. Uh, a lot of gym work, a lot of strength work, a lot of speed work. Um, we keep our cardio up at the same time. Um, <laughs> He's getting a drink. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, we keep our cardio up. So it's well all round fitness basically. Um, I'm just waffling on through what we actually do. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, it's pretty intense training up to Christmas. Um, we might have a week off before that, um, and then we have Christmas off. We come back in January and it's and it's hard training again, uh, and then it turns into role specific training towards the season. Um, so the bowlers will do a bit, bit more strength um, that's better for bowlers, and and, and same with the batsmen. That for for example, whacking a um, big track the tire with a sledgehammer, the batsmen will probably hit it like they're playing a forward drive, um, whereas the bowlers will probably come up over the shoulder and strengthen up everything for uh, bowling and, and moving through the crease. Um, so the, uh, the batting one and then, forward drives can so be... So, luckily enough, um, with... Wait, what's that? Uh, the batting one with the hit the forward drives can be a bit dangerous. I know a few have nearly hit their shins trying to do that. Um, probably prepare yeah. for current season, really, if you for a few of them. Yeah. Taking a few on the shin. Definitely uh, make it more role-specific and give them pads just a bit more uh, PPE. <laughs> but uh, now, l- luckily enough, for the way that cricket's gone financially, um, we we don't have to get a job through, or most, most of us don't have to get a job through the winter. Um, I think it's by choice that you could do an extra little bit. I know that you're doing a bit of delivery. Uh, just trying to keep On busy. your bike. So uh, if anyone's ordering a takeaway, expect trots. Um, but... Uh, no, l- luckily enough, thanks to thanks to Morgan as well, that we, we don't have to go away and work and we can focus on our cricket and skills um, throughout the winter. So, uh, what, what was the last part of the question? Um, the last part was, do you ever consider life after cricket? Um, oh, yeah. So, uh, so I'm, I'm on a rookie deal now, um, on a rookie contract, and part of that contract is actually... Um, doing a certain amount of hours to work towards after, uh, after life after cricket, which is an, an amazing thing that I think they've come up with uh, through the PCA, that um, it just sort of sets out people, gives, gives people a few ideas um, for life after cricket, because anything could happen. 
um, and it could come sooner rather than later. Um, so you, you we're always preparing. I, I know I've done a, um, I, well, I've got a few ideas. Uh, I've not done a great deal towards them at, at, as we speak, um, but I've got a few ideas going into personal training. Um, I love photography, so that, there's an idea as well. Um, taking photos of ducks on a pond or something like that, and uh, relate it back to my batting. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot that we do. Um, there's a lot that we do towards life after cricket, which um, I think if, if people look up Salt um, and they see what, what business he's doing with his motorbikes, um, that's, uh, as I think that's all, I think he's won an award, doesn't he? The Futures Award um, that almost celebrates really well for life after cricket and preparing for life after cricket. Yeah, he, um, yeah, he won the Future, PCO Futures Award um, for his um, kind of work with outside the game and um, looking ahead to, to when he finishes. Um, I believe that's probably probably where he is at the moment and why he can't. he's not taking this interview himself. He's probably trying to fix yeah. a motorbike, taking a photo of the motorbike or essentially mm -hmm. making some coffee um, or trying to make some coffee. So, uh, yeah, he's probably <laughs> doing one of those three things at the moment. But yeah, he's uh, he's certainly up there in terms of the amount of work he puts in outside the game, which is I think every, pretty much every every cricketer needs to do in order to kind of prepare themselves for the inevitability of having to retire. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's, it's definitely for us. It's worth doing. It's a hundred percent worth doing because we're. Unlike most jobs, we're, we're not going to be able to retire and then live on what we've earned. Um, so we're not, we're, we're not playing cricket until we're 60 and then taking our pension out and, and living on what we've earned. Um, if I could play cricket until I was 60, I'm sure I would, but it's just, that's not realistic. So I think the, your the, gun scores would be going down, man. What's that? I think your speed gun scores would be going down. I'm not sure, not sure <laughs> I'd be registering at 60. <laughs> Be coming off three steps. Yeah, I would say mine don't register. Or I'd like mine to register a bit more now, but they probably wouldn't be registering too much then. <laughs> there we go. So uh, move on to the final question, which is from Gershan at Swansea CC. Um, so his question is quite a detailed one. Um, so he currently finds it difficult to read batsmen and improve his pace along with his line and length um, what can he work on in order to improve and show his true ability and then enable himself to make it onto the bigger stage um i think first you you're probably best on focusing on on your accuracy um if you if you play in there if you focus on your accuracy you can build your pace up from there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I think reading, reading batsmen is always going to be quite difficult. Everybody's different. You've got, a, you, you've got the chance to bowl at 11 different batsmen. Um, there's a very little chance that they're all going to be the same. Um, so reading batsmen, if, if you bowl a ball and they look a bit uncomfortable with that ball, you could, you could probably take that you can pencil that in as a um, as a weakness, uh, but then it could be that you bowl the same ball and they whack it. So then you've really got to go back to your stock ball and figure out what is his weakness, and then try and penetrate that weakness with a little bit of a plan. Yeah, I would say uh, I think for someone growing up, I think that comes from experience. I think playing and playing more games yeah. comes from experience. And I would say if you watch Sky. Um, Kind of cricket, and you look at the, like the ex players from the game, both of them holding, and kind of really look at their analysis of batsmen and just pick up how they think about and how they watch batsmen and what they look for. I think is one of the key things for youngsters growing up. It's just really concentrate, have kind of learned from the coverage. Yeah, one one hundred percent. I'd I'd take it from Michael holding over me any day. Um, so it to be fair. From that, I'd say you're probably best off watching one of them videos to to learn about reading a batsman and where to start. Because um, you've got to start the experience somewhere, and the 
more bats when you bowl at, um, the more you will get the experience to figure out who's who and what's what. Um, so go, going on to um, improving, uh, improving your pace. So what, once you've sort of improved your line and length and tried to get that accu accuracy um, on, on the spot, I, my, my biggest, um, biggest thing for me, even when I'm bowling, is trying to stay between that wall. So almost imagining there's a wall either side of you and trying to bowl and stay inside there so your arms aren't moving away. I'm just trying to stay forward and pulling yourself through towards the batsman. Uh, and I, th I think it, once you get used to that, um, your line and length will improve naturally as well. Um, and, and you'll find your natural line and length. Um, but your pace will come with, with age as well and getting bigger and stronger, um, which is what people have told me. And, and it, has, it has happened. Um, so Ability as well? I've gone, what's that? Flexibility as well. I know you've uh, you've been in on uh, some of our yoga and Pilates stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah fle flexibility. It's, it's a massive thing. Like flexibility, um, not doesn't mean being able to put your foot over your head. I know, but you it just means. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it it just means that you, your muscles are a lot more supple and being able to. Because if I'm stiff. I know for a fact, if I come back for a fourth day of bowling in the heat and I'm stiff, I'm going to be bowling a, a lot slower than, or feeling a lot slower, which then mentally puts you, uh, puts you in the dirt. Um, but being flexible and being able to bowl properly, it, it really does help just with the smallest things and being able to get your arm up and move it quicker and come down. Being able to flick your wrist and, and pull yourself through, it, it helps in every aspect. Um, so even to everybody else listening, um, I can't stress enough to be able to warm up properly and stretch properly. And the more stretching you do every day, just reduces that risk of injury, but also gives you that little bit more strength where you didn't think you could get the strength, if you understand that, if I've said it right. Thank you. I think, yeah, that's, I can get you agree with that. I'm, I'm a big advocate for kind of special to fast bowlers growing up. I think if you can get as much, you know, that side of things, yoga, pilates, and that side of things, I think it can only help you. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, so I think that's, that's all of it. I kind of think hopefully I haven't uh, put anyone to, to sleep this week. Um, Hopefully not. I think uh, I think you've got the next nomination, haven't you, Roman? Yeah, um, I'm going to nominate someone who I picked golf clubs up off this morning and really made an effort to do social distancing. Is Chris Cook? Okay, so we got the captain up next. Um, I'm not sure who will be doing the interviewing. Um, I think you might be stuck with me, but I'll see if Salts is, uh, has finished taking pictures of his bikes and cars or whatever <laughs> he's decided to take pictures of this week. So he might he might grace us with a, a bit better banter next time. But uh, I think I'd just like to say thank you to Roman uh, from Cricket Wales. I know it's kind of at, at the current moment, trying to keep the engagement with the kids. It's quite a big thing with them. So I'd just like to say thanks to you, Roman. And I yeah. hope it's been of some use to people who ask the questions and also to anyone else who's uh, decided to watch some of our pretty average banter, I'd imagine. So, cheers. <laughs>